name is Derek Haslam. I'm a medical oncologist and director of medical oncology at Intermountain Healthcare. And my name is Lincoln Nadal. I'm also a medical oncologist, and I am the uh, director of Intermountain Precision Genomics for Intermountain Healthcare Precision Medicine. And uh, we're excited to talk today about this recent publication. Derek was the first author, and I was the last author, on this paper titled Precision Oncology Advanced Cancer Patients Proves Overall Survival with Lower Weekly Healthcare Costs. And it was um, quite an effort. We learned a lot. And uh, Derek, you want to maybe just give a little summary of what we found in that paper? Yeah. So this was actually a continuation of a study we did earlier where we took uh, a lot of patients with advanced cancer and we took a group of those patients and we treated them just as we would normally, just kind of through the standard process. And the other group of the other half of the patients, we were able to uh, take pieces of their tumor and do this uh, next-gen sequencing on their cancers to determine what genetic mutations their, their tumors had and uh, in particular, match them with targeted drugs that were we thought were appropriate for uh, those patients. And so those were that was our that was our uh, our treatment group and that uh, received we took a group of patients who had advanced cancer, and we were able to take a group of those patients and sequence their tumors and determine what particular uh, genetic mutations were in those tumors and match them with targeted drugs that were available. Uh, most of those drugs were oral therapies, and we compared that group with a select group of a historical uh, data set that we had in our healthcare to compare them with those patients who had gotten standard therapies. Yeah, yeah, so we were really looking at those two cohorts. The one cohort was a precision medicine or targeted treatment cohort based on next-gen sequencing. The other cohort was a control cohort. And then we analyzed their overall survival and the overall healthcare costs associated. The advantage we have as an integrated healthcare system is just simply that we have um, uh, they'll be looking at, at all the costs associated with cancer care from you know, not only the drugs that we use, but also, uh, but also the labs that we order and the infusions that people get and the ER visits and the hospital visitations and all those sorts of things which you're able to measure and track. I, you know, one of the hardest parts of this, I, thought, I remember doing this, was finding matches for patients in those two cohorts. So we matched patients in the precision medicine cohort and control cohort according to age, gender, diagnosis, and number of previous treatments they had gotten for their cancer. And and ultimately, we found 44 patients that fit that had those matches, but it was hard to get there. Right? It was hard to find the control cohort. Yeah, the difficult part was trying to match their lines of therapy that they had received previously. But we thought that was a really important uh, part of it. You know, a lot of the a lot of the uh, arguments against precision medicine has been that you know we use it on patients who are going to succeed or are going to do well anyway. And, and so this we thought helped to kind of tease out factor. So these are patients who were heavily pretreated, and whether they were in the treatment arm or the, or the comparison arm, they were heavily pretreated patients with lots of chemotherapy they received. In fact, if I remember correctly, I shouldn't say that. In fact, the average patient had over three lines of three prior uh, target therapy. That's right. That's right. They, made, in both cohorts, on average, had received three previous treatments. The other part of this study that I thought was hard, and um, this came out in some of the reviews, is that we didn't sequence, we didn't do genomic on patients in the control cohort. We were just looking at genomics in the patients who were in the precision medicine or targeted treatment cohort, and we used those genomics to guide their therapy. And the potential criticism, of course, is that, well, maybe these uh, genomic findings are not necessarily predictive of response to certain drugs, but simply prognostic of better outcome because of the biology of the disease. And you know, some of the reviewers actually said, well, shouldn't we be matching specific genomics so a patient in the treatment cohort, if they have a mutation in a gene called KRAS, then maybe the patient in the control cohort should also have a mutation in the same KRAS gene. Well, that's almost impossible to do. You'd have to have tens of thousands of patients. So we didn't look at it on a patient-by-patient -patient basis once they were matched. We then looked at it on a cohort level. So how did this entire cohort survive with precision medicine compared to this entire cohort who was treated with standard therapy? What did their survival look like? And what did we see? Yeah, well, I mean, to your point, there are obviously patients in, in, in science research when you're doing a study like this, especially in historical case control goals. You, you do have some limitation to that. So that was, you know, that's a, that's a criticism that's, that's fair, but but to your point as well, and matching up mutations and mutations as well, many, many, many thousands of patients to be able to do. So, but the, you know, the, the, the surprising thing we found is that taking that into consideration, using precision medicine uh, to treat these advanced cancer patients, we saw a doubling of overall survival. So rather than six months, they got 12 months. And uh, that's, that's that's big. In our world of oncology, you know, we've seen drugs approved on last two-week improvement of yeah. overall survival. So, uh, so seeing an advantage of a six-month improvement in overall survival in some of these advanced cancers is a big deal. Especially in patients who are so heavily pretreated where you wouldn't predict that kind of 
overall survival. Um, so that was pretty surprising to see a doubling of their overall survival. It was nice. It's good news for patients. But then when we looked at their overall healthcare costs, that, that was also kind of a surprise because we saw actually a cost savings per week of survival, which is which is great because, again, one of the big criticisms against precision medicine has been the cost, the cost of sequencing and the cost of these targeted drugs. But when you take into account the overall care of a patient and some of the things we looked at to be considered surrogates, I think, for improved overall quality of life, because what we really saw was cost savings when it came to reduction in ER business, reduction in hospitalizations, you know, ability to take some, a lot of these drugs uh, by mouth at home, uh, so patients are home around people they want to be around rather than in hospitals and clinics and stuff. We had to uh, we had to normalize the cost because some patients' treatment cohort live so much longer that of course it costs more to keep those patients alive. So if you normalize healthcare costs to week of survival, then we saw an almost eight hundred dollar savings per patient per week of survival using precision medicine. I didn't actually I thought it would be a lot more expensive to use precision medicine. So I didn't see that. That was kind of a surprise. And that was inclusive of all the, of all the costs associated with sequencing and, and the targeted drugs and everything else associated with that. So I think it's a really good look into the overall perspective of what it costs to care and against uh, cancer addiction. You know, and the, uh, you know we had, to your point, we had to normalize those costs. And that's, that's an important concept. But I, I think that, you know, for instance, it takes, it costs more money to treat people with dialysis yeah. than to let them die of kidney failure. Yeah. And so that's always going to be kind of an argument and always going to be something that's just, uh, as a society we have to weigh and with those costs associated with you know, quality of life years. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm high enough pay scale to make those kind of decisions. <laughs> so I think our, our oh, you're really high on pay scale. <laughs> oh, no. You should be making those decisions. <laughs> so I think that you know those are important things that we'll continue to wrestle with. Wrestle with is the cost of healthcare in general to rise. But, but nevertheless, to see something that was thought to be, that, that thought was going to cost so much more money actually result in cost savings. Yeah, I mean, the extreme skeptic would say, well, um, you're saving money per week in the precision medicine cohort, but they live twice as long, so therefore the overall costs are higher. And we actually, that, that is true, but to your point, that's the entire principle of medicine. It does cost money to keep people alive. If you were to walk out the door and get hit by a bus today, that would be sad, but it would also be a lot cheaper to take care of you than if you were to survive another 40. And that's, of course, an extreme example, but the extreme skeptics like that out there, I think that's, uh, you know, that's a challenge in healthcare. The overall costs are. So, uh, I think the summary statement from this paper is that we saw in the precision medicine cohort a doubling of the overall survival and actually overall savings in healthcare associated costs, excuse me, a per week per patient savings in overall healthcare associated costs. And, you know, it was really fun to, that's kind of a weird word to use it in this kind of setting, but it was fun to do an analysis that included not only survival and genomics, but also costs. Honestly, we haven't seen very many papers out there that include not only survival, but the healthcare costs. And we've gotten a lot of comments from about that. Uh, and, it, and it really is because it's the unique, situ the, the unique situation that we live in as an integrated healthcare system that has, you know, access to, you know, all the ER data and all the cost data and laboratory data and all those kinds of things we need to sort of generate that amount of information. So, so it is a unique place to be. You know, I think that, uh, you know, obviously it's not a very big study. So we have yeah. as one of the organizations that are in the small. And, you know, the other thing is one of the things that we are looking at now is really moving up precision medicine in the line of care. So rather than waiting until somebody is really advanced and they failed you know, three or four months of treatment, would it make sense to do precision medicine or, or take this approach in some first time? Yeah. I, the, the number one question that we seem to get when we talk about this study and our precision medicine efforts in general is, why don't we do this sooner? You know, as mentioned, we were, we were implementing these targeted therapies as like fourth line treatment these patients. And why not do it first line? And a lot of people even say, why not do it in stage three or stage two cancers? I think it's hard to justify doing this in stage two or stage three cancers where we know there is an ability to cure. I think in those situations where you can cure an early stage cancer, we are obligated to pursue curative pathways. So the patients that don't have a well-described, well-documented, proven curative pathway, then we can implement these strategies early. And I, I agree. That's where we're going in the future, right? That's one of our future topics. That is, and like, you know, there are obviously examples of that right now already, you know, in the lung cancer Cancers where we start off with targeted therapies or sometimes the melanoma that we stop off with targeted therapies, just as a couple of examples. And so I don't think uh, it's far-fetched to think of it that way. And I think the other thing that 
we learn by doing this and kind of our, you know, on the whole in general with our precision medicine program, precision oncology program, is really, it helps to kind of outline the, kind of gives you a roadmap yeah. of, of treatments for these patients. Um, and so you always know what the next option is going to be. They already put an option that stops working or fails to work. Yep. Another major future effort, and this is becoming a current effort, is to take all of these genomic analysis capabilities, bioinformatics capabilities uh, that we've been developing over the last five years and use them on some of our archival historical samples. We have uh, in our possession in Inland Healthcare five million, 5 million samples that have been collected and archived since 1975. So we're starting to pull some of those out and ask you know, hypothesis-driven questions about certain stages of disease and how did, what were those patients' outcomes like, and then do a genomic analysis and look for biomarkers that are prognostic. And yeah, that's the important part of it is it's coupled with the electronic medical record that takes back that long as well. So we know what the outcome of those patients are. We actually know what their family history is. We know what their you know, tolerance of uh, different therapies and their outcomes with regards to surgeries and those sorts of things. So so I think that there's a, a real potential uh, through that, through that uh, those projects, and those yeah, projects, those efforts uh, through that. Asset. Oh yeah. <laughs> Through those assets we have at Intermountain Healthcare uh, to be able to really sort of answer some of those questions and be able to hopefully be a little bit more, more educated and smart and predictive about what drugs we should use in certain situations. Yeah. We think that the answers to how we treat future patients are locked away in those samples from the past. So we're diving into those. So any other um, future things we should talk about or learnings from this? I think, I mean, I think it tells us we have, we still have a lot of work to do and a long ways to go, but I think it's certainly a start and, and uh, gives us momentum going forward to continue trying to answer some of these tough questions. Yeah, I mean, I think we can glean from this that it looks like precision medicine may improve survival and the, the cost of short cost savings. I think it says something about the historical clinical trial structure and that these large randomized phase three clinical trials in a precision medicine setting are probably not feasible and we've got to be more um, innovative in our clinical trial design. And I think it says something about the potential power of genomics in guiding treatment pathways for patients with cancer. And that, that's exciting. That's good news. I mean, 40 years we've been trying to make progress. You know, since the war on cancer was declared in 1970, we've been trying to make progress. And this is one of the advancing pillars in oncology right now for how we can improve outcomes for cancer patients. That's, I think it's, you know, and we've seen, uh, you know, it's always... It's always difficult to bring up anecdotes, but we have a lot of anecdotes yeah. uh, perspective that with, with, with a lot of patients that we have seen that we have been able to buy quality time for with these uh, with these uh, targeted therapies. You know, by no means do we think it's a cure. You know, do we think we're getting closer? Yeah. Do I think we are we closer to turning this into more of a chronic disease? Yeah, I think no. we are. Uh, you know, by by no means are we there yet, uh, but I think we're on the right path. Well, should we do some jumping jacks?